And it's clear why he does that, because he wants to have these political assassinations be a part of the story, and you obviously can't do that naming real, you know, real-world politicians are at that time. It's not Bond going to save Margaret Thatcher. 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 Get my lawyer! Well, really, Mr. Bond. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome to a review of the eighth John Gardner James Bond continuation novel, Win, Lose, or Die. A book that does indeed see James Bond saving the lives of Margaret Thatcher, Mikhail Gorbachev, and George H.W. Bush. And to think that I thought Mind Control Ice Cream was as crazy as these books could get. My god, those early naive days. So the plot for this one is that an international terrorist organization known as BAST is planning to sabotage an upcoming political summit. That's BAST as in B-A-S-T, standing for the Brotherhood of Anarchy and Secret Terror, which does not exactly have the same ring nor elegance to it as something like Spectre does, but there we go. The summit is supposed to be taking place in a year's time from the start of the book when Bond receives his mission, and it's to be taking place on a British Royal Navy aircraft carrier HMS Invincible, and so Bond is dispatched to keep an eye on the place and look out for any double agents in the build-up to the summit. So Bond is returned to active duty in the Navy, and he's even promoted, for so now he's Captain Bond instead of Commander Bond, which is pretty cool, but I, I have to admit that I'm so used to knowing the Bond character as a commander that reading Captain Bond did take a little while to get used to. But I really like the idea of putting Bond back in the Navy. It's such an important part of the character's history, and it's very seldom expanded on in stories, so putting him back into that place for an entire book makes a lot of sense to me. Bond even learns to fly a Harrier jet in this, and it does read in a few places like, all right, John Gardner saw Top Gun recently and thought I'll have me some of that, but it does make sense to Bond's character nonetheless, even if Gardner is, I would say, quite clearly being influenced by that very popular Tom Cruise movie that came out just a handful of years prior to this book's publication. I'm perhaps a little bit less enthusiastic about the overall villain's plan here. Like, Bast's whole scheme when you boil it down is basically to kidnap the leaders of the UK, USA, and Russia and hold them to ransom for $600 billion. And despite these obviously being huge stakes, I mean, this is like Thunderball level stakeage going on here. Despite that, the fact that it only becomes apparent to us, the readers, quite late on in the book, what the exact plan is. It's teased throughout a lot of the story. And the fact that it does end up being something so basic as oh, we're just going to kidnap world leaders and hold them to ransom. It is a little bit disappointing. And it does indeed end up being Bond saving Thatcher, Bush, and Gorbachev. But um, hold on to that thought for a moment, because this is supposed to be like a big surprise. The reveal of those three characters, and they are characters in this book, is, is supposed to be a, a reveal uh, moment. And there's kind of a bit of a build up to it. And they're referred to as the big three in earlier chapters of the book. And you're not really sure what's going on. Uh, that's the intention anyway, but it is spoiled on the blurb of my book. Win, Lose, or Die is the eighth in Gardner's series of Bond novels and features Thatcher, Butch, and Gorbachev in a tense roller coaster of a plot. This is like the second or third time a detail that is supposed to be a surprise of the story is revealed on the back of the, of the thing. I should really just stop reading those things before I dive into these. It did feel a bit weird to me that this information was withheld for a good chunk, about like two thirds of the story. As I say, the, the reference is made to the big three, and Bond knows the information, but I, I felt a little weird that as a reader, Bond knew more information that was being withheld from me, because I feel that so often in these stories, you are on the same page as Bond, and you're learning and discovering things at the same time pace as he is. And then as well as that, there are a good few chunks of the book that are actually dedicated to following other characters that are out of Bond's periphery for much of the story. I mean, we see the villains manipulating 
you know, relatively ordinary people and putting their plans into action, so we end up knowing more than Bond does about some of the villainous organization's machinations. I think it's an interesting way to tell the story, to deviate from Bond's point of view on... <laughs> I mean, li literally, I... I dare I say, maybe even a third of the book is written from a perspective that is not Bond's, and that's quite unusual. I can only think of Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me as another Bond story that's written from a different perspective. I think it's an interesting way of telling the story, and it certainly you know, differentiates this from the previous Gardner books that I've read, but I don't know how much of it ultimately, when you get to the end of the book, it feels like, well, that was a lot of padding to cover the fact that this plot is actually very thin. So when it comes to the big three, and God, I just, I can't even believe that Gardner goes here. Uh, at the end of the last book, we had Bond saving the lives of the US president and UK prime minister. They weren't mentioned by name, but apparently they were indeed intended to be uh, real world politicians. It was uh, Reagan th that time, uh, and Thatcher, obviously UK prime minister. Uh, in both of these stories, apparently. Now it's Bush as president, and Gorbachev is thrown into the mix, and Bond greets them all in turn in a chapter of this thing, and has a, more than a couple of exchanges with the trio as the story goes on, and it's just so weird that Bond has dialogue with Margaret Thatcher. I mean, where's a parrot when you need one? <laughs> So yeah, the elephant in the room is that, yes, Thatcher did appear as a character at the end of Fiora Eyes Only. Uh, th that was very much just a little gag, a silly little gag. Here, she's very much a huge part of the plot, which is really weird and cartoony. And indeed, this feels like a plot from a James Bond Jr. two-parter. Though I did find the inclusion of Gorbachev to be somewhat significant. I mean, this is a really interesting time in history here. This book is releasing in 1989, the same year that the Berlin Wall is coming down. And I'm going to be curious to see how Gardner reacts to this real-world change in geopolitics over the next few books. Certainly, this is the most cooperation between the West and Russia in these James Bond stories that I can remember in any of these books, Fleming and Continuation, uh, except for maybe the Spy Who Loved Me novelization, so I'm going to be very interested to see how this develops further over the next few books, assuming that Gardner just doesn't doesn't just ignore it. <laughs> anyway, this story has all your usual tropes and trappings of the John Gardner series so far. There are double agents, there are characters with too many alternate names and aliases. There's a character named Clover who is with the Royal Navy, she's a Wren, and when Bond first hears that there's got to be women on the ship, he's all like, oh, women on the ship, I'm not so sure about that. And indeed, he's proven totally correct because they're all double agents. And Bond and his team must then kill all of them in the climax of the story. Which was another very weird detail, like the whole action climax of the end of this is Bond and his comrades going and taking out this, like, I think there's 15 of them, I think it's a 15 wrens who are all in on the villain scheme. <laughs> Bond and his cohorts are just like knifing them and shooting them and stuff. It's, it's, it, I think it's weird because Bond hardly ever kills women in the books or the films. And here he's like snapping their necks and getting them in headlocks and stuff. It's just a bit jarring. And don't get me wrong, I am an equal opportunist when it comes to uh, villains. And it's kind of novel that this group is made up of these young women. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen all that much in these stories. So again, it's, it's a memorable detail, but it is just odd reading lines like, and then Bond knifed the girl between the shoulder blades. It's just, it's, it's a little odd. So once the ransom plot is foiled, Bond heads over to Gibraltar to apprehend the leader of Bast. And of course, this is a John Gardner book, so obviously the guy has two names and an alias. So he's Bassam Baraj, and his real name is Robert Besavitsky, and his code name is Viper, and obviously, just to make things super clear, all of these <laughs> names are interchangeable throughout the bulk of this story. Like I say, he's the leader of this organization, so it's a shame that he doesn't make much of an impression, and kind of similar to the guy who was in charge of Spectre a couple of books ago, Tamil Rahani. It's a shame that these villains come across so weakly characterized. I genuinely can't think of a single adjective to describe either of these characters. They're just so 
blank, and yet here they are. They're supposed to be the kind of Blofeld equivalents, I guess. Faraj is killed at the end of the story, and I do quite like the whole chase leading up to his death. It's in Gibraltar, and Bond is chasing him through tunnels, like in the rock of Gibraltar itself, which is really cool, but the fact that I, I guess there's no chance of the guy coming back for another story is somewhat disappointing, because I was kind of wondering if he was indeed supposed to be the next Blofeld, and Bast was going to be the new Spectre for the rest of the Gardner continuation novels, and how this book ends, I guess not. <laughs> this is one of those things where I, I, I say like, oh, I guess that's this is my prediction, and then you in the comments will tell me like, oh, just you wait for three books time, he'll do something nutty with them. So, uh, okay, maybe Bast Spectre, you know, form some kind of... Uh, super villain agency uh, in a couple of books. God, that's not even out of the realm of possibility, is it? But it's not Bond who kills the villain. Oh no, it's Beatrice Maria de Ricci, who is working for the British Secret Service, and initially she's protecting Bond while he's on holiday, and they're at this villa together, about like, it's about a third of the way through the book, I think, and kind of weirdly he's falling for her. Um, it's Christmas time during this story, and Bond is reflecting on Tracy and how he wished he could have spent more Christmases with her and such, and you know, I've said this in a few other John Gardner about a couple of the other stories as well, that whenever Bond gets melancholy about his dead wife, I think those passages are really well done and really nice reflections, and that's no different here. I think that some of those pages were my favourite of this entire book. So yeah, it's Christmas time, but bad luck for Bond. Beatrice is apparently killed in a car bomb um, after a few days of them swanning around this villa. And I, re reading this, I thought that was a really shocking moment. I did not see it coming. It certainly made me sit up, and it had my undivided attention for a little while after. Um, but then much later on in the book, it is revealed that she actually faked her death in an attempt at diverting another attempt on Bond's life or something. They come to the conclusion that, oh no, she needs to fake her death and then it'll take the, the edge off Bond. I, I don't know. Just another Gardner trope, though, the, the idea that there is some twist and then it's so, like the twist is so convoluted and out of the blue that half a chapter is dedicated to the character explaining like why they did it and then Bond is like but wait a minute what about XYZ and then the character has to explain in nauseating detail why they had to go about doing things in such convoluted ways and it's just again it's just it's a trope of these stories at this point I'm just like alright this is the chapter where it's full of Bond during his, uh, but wait a minute. Anyway, I guess that Beatrice is gonna be a fairly significant relationship for Bond because by the end of the story, he has apparently fallen in love with her. He actually says, I love you to her. And with all of the Tracy callbacks and, you know, set at Christmas time, like Honor Magic Secret Service was set at Christmas time and New Year, I, I believe we're supposed to think that Beatrice is some kind of a significant relationship on par with Tracy? I mean, it certainly feels like that idea is being pushed, and certainly a lot more than any other woman in the John Gardner era. Uh, but <laughs> given his tendency for just dropping things, uh, I I'm not anticipating her to come back in the next one. The next book in this series is the License to Kill novelization, so unless he's really gonna go on a tangent with that, I can't see her coming back in that story. Just before I wrap up, little very nerdy point uh, of order <laughs> that I wanted to bring up, but I, I'm just curious when it comes to the continuity of these things. Obviously, Gardner's Bond is continuing on from the same continuity as Ian Fleming's Bond, but there is a detail in here which suggests, anyway, that Gardner considers uh, Kingsley Amos's Colonel Sun to be in his canon. In Colonel Sun, a big part of that plot is that M is kidnapped, and at the start of the thing there's a raid on his home, and his uh, butler and the butler's wife are both killed, and these are Mr. and Mrs. Hammond. And in Win, Lose, or Die, Bond visits uh, M's home, and uh, as Gardner puts it, seconds later the stout door was unbolted from inside and opened to reveal M's servant, Davison, who had replaced the faithful ex-chief petty officer Hammond. He goes into no more detail than that, but I just find it interesting that, oh, okay, in Gardner's continuity, the Hammonds are no longer around, and 
I again it's not an explicit point or anything but he could have just quite simply ignored Colonel Sun and moved on with it so I'm just you know I, I, I just thought that that was a nice interesting little continuity detail so yeah I guess overall this book was just a bit of a shrug from me uh, largely down to the fact that the plot is so thin and I feel like it meanders around for a little too long uh, while we wait to get into the inevitable it also suffers from a lot of the same pitfalls as so many other Gardner stories uh, too many characters too many alternate names and aliases uh, too many twists and double crossings for the sake of twists and double crossings but I do nonetheless still really like the concept of Bond going back into the Navy I liked a lot of the fighter jet stuff a lot of that was quite exciting um, I'm gonna rank this one just below license renewed and just above roll of honor uh, not one of my favorites by any stretch of the imagination but there was stuff to enjoy in here nonetheless I guess I'd cite it as lower mid-tier gardener and then it just has that crazy trio of cherries on top when it comes to Thatcher, Bush and Gorbachev. Please do let me know your thoughts on this one in the comments section below. I'm really very excited about coming to the next story now. It's the License to Kill novelization, which I've... It's really been that and the GoldenEye novelization have been two of my very most anticipated ones of this, of this particular run, this particular era of Bond, so I'm very much looking forward to getting to that next. And if you haven't already, please do consider scrolling below and clicking the subscribe button as well as the Mrs. Bell notification button. Stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. There's also a variety of links below to my other social media pages if you want to follow me on those. And with all that being said, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.